Imagine that I have a sphere made out of Play-Doh. I can squish it and stretch it in any which way. In topology, a field of math, we call this squishing and stretching continuous deformation. I can continuously deform my sphere into a cube or a tetrahedron just by flattening out the sides. If we can get from one shape to another by continuous deformation, then these shapes are homeomorphic. Now consider a torus, a donut shape. I claim that I can never reach the torus from the sphere by continuous deformation. I would either have to stretch the sphere into a log and then glue the ends together, or punch a hole in the middle of the sphere Neither of these actions are allowed with continuous deformation. This means that the sphere and the torus are fundamentally different, and that difference lies in the whole. We can quantify this difference with something called the Euler characteristic. This is a number we systematically assign to each shape. Two shapes are homeomorphic if and only if they have the same Euler characteristic. You may have heard this fact about three-dimensional polytopes, that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is two. For example, we can take the cube and the tetrahedron, which are both homeomorphic to the sphere, by the way. The tetrahedron has four vertices, six edges, and four faces. And four minus six plus four is two. The cube has eight vertices, 12 edges, and six faces. And eight minus 12 plus six is also two. This fact is true for all three-dimensional polytopes, not just the regular platonic solids like the cube and the tetrahedron. And all three-dimensional polytopes are homeomorphic to the sphere. We're going to denote the sphere as S2 for two-dimensional sphere, and we denote the Euler characteristic with the Greek letter chi. The Euler characteristic of the sphere is two, and that is why this fact holds for all polytopes. So to find the Euler characteristic of any surface in general, let S be our surface, which we imagine to be something smooth without vertices or edges. And now we subdivide it into polygons. So both the cube and the tetrahedron are polyhedral subdivisions of the sphere. Then the Euler characteristic of S is the number of vertices in the subdivision minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. And this value does not depend on the specific way that we subdivide the surface into polygons, just like how the cube and the tetrahedron both gave the same value for V minus E plus F. That fact takes a little bit of proof, so I encourage you to look into it if you're interested, but don't worry about it for right now. I'll leave a reference in the description. So the Euler characteristic of a surface tells you, in a sense, how many holes the surface has. Let's find the Euler characteristic of the torus. This little guy is a torus divided into polygons. Notice that some of the vertices, like this one, stick out, while some of the vertices, like this one, are flush with the surface of the shape. When we're counting the vertices, edges, and faces of this model, we want to pay attention to the lines on its surface so that we can count the hidden vertices, edges, and faces. Now we can use V minus E plus F to determine the order characteristic of the torus. This shape has vertices on the outside corners, vertices along the edges, and vertices in the inside corners. 
The top has 16 vertices and the bottom also has 16. So there are 32 vertices in total. Notice that there are a lot of edges to count. So let's make it a bit easier. First, observe that each edge is part of exactly two faces. Then because this subdivision is made up of squares, each face contains exactly four edges. So if we count the number of faces and then multiply that by four, we've counted each edge exactly twice. This gives the equation 4 times f, the number of faces, is 2 times e, the number of edges, which means that 2f equals e. Hence, we just have to count the number of faces instead of counting the number of edges, which is a lot easier. There are 8 faces on top, 12 around the outside, eight on bottom, and four on the inside. Eight plus 12 is 20, plus eight is 28, plus four is 32. 32 total faces. So F is 32, and E is 64, and so V minus E plus F is zero. So the Euler characteristic of the torus is zero. We denote the torus as T2 because this is the two-dimensional torus. So here we have what's called the net of the cube. We want to focus on this angle right here. See that the three squares around this vertex fold up to meet each other. So there's this 90 degree angle missing to have the cube lie flat at the vertex. This is called the angle deficiency at this vertex. All vertices of the cube are identical. Wait, hold on a second. What about this angle right here? Doesn't this look different from the first one that we looked at? Well, we have to think about how this net folds up. When we fold the net into the cube, there will be three squares meeting at this vertex too, making it look identical to the first one that we looked at. So how the vertex looks in the net can be deceiving. Okay, so there are eight identical vertices each with an angle deficiency of pi over two. We use the Greek letter delta to denote angle deficiency. That's eight times pi over two equals four, four pi total angle deficiency over the whole shape. Hmm, let's hold on to that and we'll look at the tetrahedron. This vertex here has an angle deficiency of 180 degrees, or pi. And even though some of the angles in the net look a little different, we know that a tetrahedron has four identical vertices. So all of the vertices have an angle deficiency of pi. That's four vertices times pi angle deficiency, giving four pi total angle deficiency. So we found that even though the cube and the tetrahedron have different numbers of vertices and different angle deficiencies, they have the same total angle deficiency. If we put the sphere in the picture, the sphere has a Euler characteristic of 2. And we can rewrite 4 pi as 2 pi times 2. And we remember that the cube and the tetrahedron are both homeomorphic to the sphere. Okay, this leads us into the Gauss-Binet theorem. We'll talk a little bit about what the combinatorial version 
part of this means in the next video. If we have a polyhedral surface S, so a surface divided into polygons that has vertices V1, V2, up to Vn, with angle deficiency delta of Vi at each vertex, then when we sum up the angle deficiency at every vertex, we will get 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the surface S. The really cool thing about the gauss binet theorem is that it draws a connection between the specific geometric properties of a surface and the big picture topological properties. That is, the geometry changes with continuous deformation, but the topology of a surface doesn't. And the gauss binet theorem draws a connection between these two different types of properties. Next time, we will see the gauss binet theorem in action and talk about a proof for this beautiful result. See you later, and as always, keep exploring.